Tonight we are extremely excited to welcome to the Union John Coleshaw. John Coleshaw is one of the most successful impressionist and comedians of his generation. He began his career on local radio. I can see some of you, some of you laughing already. It's as if you're <laughs> waiting to be entertained. He began his career on local radio in Lancashire, where he was born and raised, before progressing to national television um, and radio. Coleshaw started. Um, kind of performing to the nation at wide um, in the BBC Radio 4 series Dead Ringers and its BBC Two version between 2000 and 2007 um, and also in his own um, impressions programme The Impressionable John Coleshaw. Most recently he has starred in the new comedy sketch show um, The Impression Show with Coleshaw and Stevenson. His impressions include Tony Blair, George Bush, Ozzy Osbourne, and he was having over dinner with Brian Cox now, um, and John Bishop, and I'm sure he'll be sharing some of them with you this evening. So if you could join me in welcoming John Coleshaw. Thank you very much. Let's have uh, another round of applause for that most wonderful introduction and documentation. Let's hear it one more time. I guess some people probably just speak behind the, uh, the, the lectern here, but I thought I would stroll about and just have a sense of freedom. <laughs> and in a very real sense as the former Prime Minister of this country, and now a person who's got a book out. <laughs> it truly is a great honour to be here and join you speaking tonight. <laughs> the Cambridge. <laughs> and as we, in a very real sense, gather here in a spirit of celebration, collaboration, sense of forward-thinking entrepreneurialism, just three of the names of Bob Geldof's children, but more than that, I come here tonight to speak to you. I feel a great sense of pride. I feel a great sense of pride at my 10 years as Prime Minister of this country. Our earliest announcements, the Millennium Dome in Greenwich, now known as the O2 Centre, and it will go on to form a central part of this year's London Olympic Games, a fine, fine project which progressed a long, long way since that night when me and Mandelson had a bottle of Jack Daniels and the what was upside down on the kitchen table. <laughs> and we also acknowledge that we live in a changing world. A changing world where we must adapt to the challenges that we face. A changing world where the voice and body language of the Prime Minister was once up here and out here like that, but then uh, it was slightly different. <laughs> uh, much more self-contained. Uh, <laughs> An interesting and varied way array of hand gestures, uh, some operating in this direction, uh, some by way of contrast operating over here in this way. <laughs> and of course, the famous and interesting jaw dropping action which takes place at the end of the majority of Gordon Brown's sentences. Not quite sure why the jaw drops in this way. Usually, I think it's because he can't believe what it was he just said. <laughs> But as I now reflect on my time as Prime Minister of this country, and I see Mr. Cameron and Mr. Clegg standing outside the door of number 10, my former door, like the political Jedward that they are, <laughs> and as I see Mr. Miliband making his speeches at Prime Minister's Question Time, like the fifth in-betweener that he is, <laughs> I do acknowledge that there were certain errors in my style of presentation, but I believe now those errors have been rectified, and I believe now my speeches can be heard the way they were intended to be heard by the viewers of MTV, simply by pressing the red button. <laughs> I'm the Prime Minister, the big G Brown. I was wrecking on the mic when the banks went down. <laughs> on the left of me is probity and prudence on the right, they're my bankers and they thank me because my touch was still the light. Vince Cable, he's not able to chair the G20 table. You've got to have your G-Dog to keep the market stable. 
Because I'm brown like that, yes, I'm brown like that. No one knew how prices would go down like that. <laughs> I'm brown like that, yes, I'm brown like that. My financial regulations is quite unsound like that. I'm brown like that, yes, I'm brown like that. I do that thingy with my mouth and then I frown like that. <laughs> Rolling fat notes on my clip, spending taxes like water. No tomorrow, so we borrow each financial quarter. Remember all the good times, if you couldn't forget it. It meant boom before the crunch, I would pay the credit. <laughs> And of course, we will continue to show our gratitude and our appreciation to the closest and staunchest of our allies in the modern world in recent years. I just want to say what a real fine honorification it is <laughs> to be here in your beautiful town of Cambridge, Chester, Ohio. <laughs> On this real fine occasion. <laughs> How the world of comedy. Oh my goodness gracious. It started operating. Maybe when I talked like Tom Baker, it sort of automatically uh, overrode the, uh, the dematerialization. That's the Blenovich limitation effect, as you know, as we've discussed on previous occasions. But anyway, I'm digressing now. <laughs> I quite like it where I, I don't know quite where the voices came from. A little bit later, we'll be spontaneous and we'll take some names and a few questions and we'll see where we weave. And we'll just see where, where was I? I was doing George W. Maybe that's why I forgot my way. <laughs> How the world of comedy misses George W. Bush. <laughs> Quite often I'm asked, uh, how does uh, Barack Obama replace George W. Bush in terms of comedy? And of course he doesn't. Another politician does that and we'll discuss him uh, before long. Uh, but so totally different in their style of presentation and their sense of oratory. Um, George Bush, as we know, a uh, little bit hesitant. Uh, the head sinking into the shoulders like Churchill, the car insurance doe. <laughs> And there comes the gentleman in through the door now. He's just been put over to one side and he's looking around trying to find a suitable seat and he's probably going to water it very, very soon. It? So I'm just doing a little bit of... That was an opportunity to do a bit of horse racing comedy. So sorry. So I've gone into Prince Forsyth for no reason at all. <laughs> yes, George W., of course, you know. That look on his face that Jackie Mason described so well like he can't believe he got the job. <laughs> and uh, speaking a little bit nasal and uh, hunched over, Whereas Mr. Obama, much more oratory speaking from here. <laughs> and people of America, as we face the challenges at this time, what we must do is make sure we work together. I will pledge to say one or two words over in this direction. And then a few more back this way, and then a few more in this direction, but left. <laughs> and I pledge to use my emotive words, hope, inspiration, change, looking to the future with hope in our hearts. People of America, yes we can at this defining moment. We cannot turn back. We cannot turn back. Oh, uh, let's get her ready to rumble! <laughs> and of course I think the politician who did uh, replace uh, George W. Bush in terms of comedy, well I think probably top on that list is uh, the glorious Boris Johnson Blanc. <laughs> Yes, uh, the lovely Boris, of course, uh, with those flailing arms yeah, and that peroxide blonde hair, like some sort of uh, Star Trek adversary alien. But the only person outside of the Beano who says cripes. <laughs> yes, cripes and stone the crows. I, I, I still asked if I was surprised when Michael Howard sacked me from the shadow cabinet for saying something offensive to the people at some town or other, and um, that's on a weekly basis. And I, I, I said, of course I was surprised when Michael Howard sacked me from the Shadow Cabinet. I didn't realise I was in the Shadow Cabinet. <laughs> but of course, I'm very happy to announce to you today, ladies and gentlemen, that the venue uh, in the forthcoming Olympics for the ladies' beach volleyball has now been switched to my back garden. <laughs> uh, so let's hope for a Brazil-Sweden final. Blah! <laughs> And indeed, welcome back to tonight with Sir Trevor MacDonald. And remember, if you or your family have been affected by any of the issues raised in tonight's programme, 
Don't worry, Coronation Street will be on in again in a moment. I'm sorry, I'll be there again. <laughs> what was the initial gag there? I'm sorry, yes, Coronation Street will be on in a moment to cheer you all up again. But first, entertainment news, and with the economic downturn affecting sales of DVDs, classic movies are now being re-edited to maximise revenue with greater levels of product placement. You cannot win, da. <laughs> yes, the acoustics for Obi-Wan Kenobi are slightly better in here than at the Oxford Union. <laughs> yes, I can probably do it slightly longer than I normally do. Yes, you cannot win, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Yes, you've got to be very careful doing the Obi-Wan Kenobi impression, because if you veer away from the Alec Guinness accent, it sort of goes somewhere a bit scout, and you end up sort of slightly near to John Lennon like that. <laughs> and then it goes out of control, and you can't fight your way back, and before you know it, you're in Paul O'Grady territory. <laughs> here, no, oh here, leave it. So here we go back to the voice of Alec Guinness to try to remember what the original joke was. <laughs> There's product placement in the movies. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. Commander of the arms of the North. General of the Felix Legions. Loyal servant to the true Emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife. But that's when I called injury lawyers for you. <laughs> For many years, he's been one of my favourite characters, Russell Crowe. There's many shades to his accent. Sometimes you uh, you have the uh, familiar uh, Shakespearean uh, gladiator or master and commander accent. And then if he's a little bit more relaxed and he's on, you know, Jonathan Ross's new talk show on ITV, he'll relax a little bit and he'll become more of a stroppy, pug-faced git like that. <laughs> but I've always thought that if you gave Russell Crowe a Lancashire accent, he would turn into Les Dawson. <laughs> I'm so happy you've earned it. My name's Maximus Decimus Meridius. Do you want one of those characters from that golden age of TV? I remember as a lad watching Mike Yarwood on a Saturday night. Uh, all sort of uh, very inspired by Mike Yarwood. And he had uh, his key characters. Frank Spencer was one of them. And all the other impersonators of the time would do sort of Mike Yarwood's impression of Frank Spencer rather than their own because it was so strongly in the mind. And it's, a, it's an interesting way to sort of mark uh, a time culturally by the, the sort of characters that the impersonators choose to do at that time. My favourite Frank Spencer character of uh, the 1980s was uh, another Frank, Frank Bruno. I like doing Frank Bruno because, you know, his big voice shouldn't come out of my little neck, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> another favourite, uh, the, the Frank Spencer character of the 90s. Um, another boxer, Christopher Livingston Eubank, who speaks in this interesting way with a sort of compressed lisp and walks around as though he has a cucumber inserted into his butter. <laughs> Who else do we have? My favourite uh, Frank Spencer character of the last 10 or 12 years or so. I suppose, yeah, David Beckham really, you know, quite a light little voice like that, as you know, talking out one side of his mouth. Yeah, David Beckham, the body of an athlete, the voice of a Tesco checkout girl. <laughs> Some of the favourite Frank Spencer characters at the moment. There's, there's a wonderful selection, actually, uh, especially amongst the comedians. Michael McIntyre's sort of pointy fingers, sort of vibrating hands, sort of awesome. Michael McIntyre's sort of pointy fingers, sort of vibrating hands, sort of awesome. Such an obsession with technology and the letter I. You have the iPod, you have the iPlayer, you have the iPhone, you have iTunes, you have the iPlayer, you have all of these things. <laughs> Our children will grow up thinking an idea is some sort of digital antelope. This is what they will think. This is what they will think. I've written in there. Who's another favourite comedian? Uh, I nearly, uh, he was nearly the next stop after Paul O'Grady. Bob, John Bishop, who did that? That me. Just an ordinary lad from Liverpool. Would the ear. At the Cambridge Union Avenue Bates. <laughs> With all you lot when I asked school, he said I was thick. It's me dream come true. Who's another favourite at the moment? Um, I think so, certainly Alan Carr. <laughs> I know Alan Carr is another one where sometimes the voice is a little bit low, it's a little bit low, and sometimes it goes very high. <laughs> 
But Alan Carr, he walks around like a villain on Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Always been the fascinating sporting characters. I think my favourite sporting character right now, mainly because um, he appears to learn seven or eight extra words of English every England game. Um, is uh, I think uh, Fabio the uh, <laughs> the hesitations are getting a bit. Uh, a little bit. I think somebody stole his Learn English DVD and replaced it. Uh, with the best of Tommy Cooper, because uh, the, the, their styles are getting closer and closer all the time. There must be some sort of Tommy Cooper influence there somewhere. I'm hoping that some of the post-match interviews in Euro 2012 go a little bit tough. Uh, well, I, uh, I say to the players to uh, play the game, to uh, dictate the, the pace of the game, to uh, uh, the flowing game between uh, Rooney Lampard, Rooney Lampard, Lampy Rooney. <laughs> I hope uh, the uh, influence of uh, English culture rubs off in that way. Uh, let's be a little bit spontaneous now. If there's any uh, questions or names of characters, uh, let's see where we weave to with this. Uh, either I will know it and we'll, we'll go straight in there, or it might remind us of another character. Uh, a little weave of spontaneity. Any questions or names? Let's uh, see where we get to. Do call them out. Yes, I have a lot of thinking going on going on. Right? <laughs> Yes, hello. Hello, there. I've, got, I've gone into Bruce Forsyth for no reason. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Professor Brian Cox. <laughs> you see, the whole reason for doing it. <laughs> is to sort of look up at something bright <laughs> and sort of point. And of course the universe as we know is enormous and vast. In our galaxy there are 450 billion stars and that's amongst 300 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And we know that the universe is probably infinite and goes on forever and ever. Yet despite this colossal size, how can we explain that you'll always bump into your ex in Sainsbury's when you look like crap? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful character. I, uh, I've, I've worked with him a few times, and um, you know the way that he describes the solar system in terms of sort of fruit and veg. <laughs> Because our solar system, if you were to scale it down to size, Mercury would be a peppercorn. And then you would have Venus and the planet Earth, which would be sort of cherry tomatoes. And then Mars would be about the size of a blueberry. And then you get the asteroid belt, which you could probably do with rebels. And then... <laughs> the great gas giants of Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter would probably be like a big watermelon or something, but Saturn's a little bit smaller, still big and everything, but you could do that with big grapefruit and stuff like that. <laughs> and then Neptune and Uranus would be tomatoes, and Pluto's dead little, so you'd probably need 100,000 of that, and that's not even a planet anymore, because the rain is too small, and that's really tight, because I think Pluto is really nice, and that is why I love the universe. <laughs> I remember a wonderful. I I, um, I, uh, I I was very honoured to take part in the 700th edition of uh, the Sky at Night, which of course featured uh, the Astronomer Royal, who we were talking about earlier. And um, I remember a conversation between uh, Sir Patrick Moore and Professor Brian Cox. And uh, Sir Patrick said, "You know, when we think of the universe, is either infinite, so we're going on forever, in which case." What's it expanding into? Or it's finite and it goes to a certain distance and then it stops, in which case, what's on the other side of that? Either way, we're stuck. <laughs> which was a beautiful summing up. Uh, let's get a few more names or questions or things like that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Gentlemen, I've gone into David Dimbleby for, for no reason at all in a question time sort of way. Yes, gentlemen over there. Yes. Yes, the, um, yes the, the, not the man from Del Monte, no, the, ma the man in the eye mask. <laughs> Next to the girl with the dragon tattoo. <laughs> yes, okay. 
Canada. Oh yes, oh, microfilms are being distributed. <laughs> yes, activate. Activate! Activate! <laughs> For your impression, that's it. Is it something you have to work on, or is it something that comes naturally? And then could you do data mission too? <laughs> well, I think um, sometimes the characters are a little bit more obscure, not quite so obvious, uh, that they might not have an obvious catchphrase that you need to get hold of. Um, Ricky Gervais doesn't have real catchphrases, it's more sort of like catch noises. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Ooh. Yeah, sort of nice, loud laugh. Reassuring, thanks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so like Brian Cox, he's quite easy because he's just got this recognisable style and I'm sort of interested in astronomy anyway, so it sort of follows on like that. Uh, other characters which are... Simon Cowell was quite awkward, I think. That takes a little bit of scrutiny. you just got to watch uh, a few editions of The X Factor on, on the Sky Plus, Lord have mercy, until uh, you sort of get into that sort of Simon Cowell uh, sort of sound I think you're all great singers. Um, I think we can turn you into recording artists. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. High trousers, man boobs, acerbic words on YouTube, American Idol, X Factor, Sunita's not my wife. <laughs> JLS is three yeses, Cheryl Coles, orange dresses, yours is the worst voice I've heard in my life. <laughs> Gary Barlow and Talisa, my new judging in a sanctum. Talisa won with Little Mix. I took the world to Jackson Bankton. I wrote that on the train coming up here, I did. I did. Um, so, David Mitchell. Yes, there's one. David Mitchell. David Mitchell's soapbox, that thing he does on the internet. One of the things when you're doing a David Mitchell, it sort of starts in a David Mitchell sort of way, and if you're not careful, it can morph into Ian Hislop. <laughs> Which is obviously uh, very jolly. Mm. <laughs> one, of the, one of the finest phrases for uh, Ian Hislop's tone of voice, I think, is Piers Morgan. <laughs> Just sort of, uh, he's a, a creature, isn't he? What a species Piers Morgan is. So, you know, this must have been a very low point in your career, and it must have been very difficult for you in your life to deal with a challenge like that cry. <laughs> Let's get a few more names or questions. Question. Ah, oh, good evening. Yes, two things. Yeah, well, now let's, let's try out. Let's have a round of applause for the trained operative standing by. <laughs> Never mind, we can hear you. We can, we can, what's your name, sir? David. Sir David, excellent. <laughs> you, you remind me of, of John Craven, actually. Uh, in, in, the, um, in, in his news round days, you know, John Craven's news round, I remember, you probably don't, all the amazing clips of it. And uh, John Craven, of course, who does country farm now, but he used to do John Craven's news round, and hair and, and the knitwear was kind of similar. Just... <laughs> Can I do an impression of you? Can I do an impression of you? Yes, I think so. Tell you what, come round, come round here. <laughs> and I'll, I'll see. I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can learn it. Um, okay. So, because uh, we have we have the, the working microphone. So let's see. Let's uh, if you just give us that question again on this one. Could you do an impression of me? I think. Uh, yeah. I think. I think your tone of voice is somewhere along there. That's where I would start. That's where I would start. By that. Can you do, yeah, that's where it would be. Can I, Can you do an impression of me? Can you do? Can you do an impression? <laughs> I think the interesting thing with you is so voices do often lead to others. And yours, that phrase there, uh, can, can you do an impression of me? It's sort of like, if you carried that on, you'd be back to <laughs> Professor Brian. So it would be a case of looking up there and saying, can you? <laughs> yeah, to, to put a bit of Brian Cox rhythm into, into your question, would be, can you do an impression of me? <laughs> And if you could, it would be 
10 to the power of 9, and it would be astonishing. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause for David. Thank you for your questions. Another one, yes. Thank you, uh, Charlie Brooker. Charlie Brooker, now there's a good one. Yes, there's a very good one. Oh, yeah, you put it up. Let's put that there. It's like, it's basically an ornament. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie Brooker, I was, I was trying to learn him for um, uh, the last series that we did. And um, we ended up dropping the sketch because we were doing John Bishop instead. <laughs> but he's, he's very much on the to-do list. I love the sort of acerbic and he's, he's wonderfully clever. So that would be what, that would be one for the future. But, but for the moment, in Patrick Moore, Moore's voice, not quite. There we go there. Hello, yes, there we are. David Cameron, he's an interesting one um, because the one hand gesture he seems to have. It's a bit like, you know, sort of pushing the button like that, pushing the button like that. Yes, <laughs> this is the hand gesture that he has only on one side when he's sort of taking the debate to a middle band, like that. Pushing the hand down, pushing the hand down as though he's hitting some sort of button like that. And I thought he should do the same with the other hand and then he'd have a nice little Charles for the sort of... <laughs> Could be a sense of that's more on David Cameron later. We're, we're not finished with him. Uh, Nick Clegg, some people say he's a little bit bland. But, you know, if, if you watch any character for long enough, patterns start to emerge and you start seeing the little traits and foibles that they do. Uh, during the leadership debates, I remember um, Nick Clegg's sort of body language was rather like sort of a swimming lesson. Um, the recurring words were openness, fairness, change, openness, fairness, change, fairness, openness, fairness, change. <laughs> That was kind of it, and so I observed that and consequently learned to swim. So, <laughs> Billy, oh, Billy Connolly. <laughs> now, here's one of those where you barely need a microphone like that, you see. Straightened across from one side of the Union, and then straightened back the other way. <laughs> like that, with a great sense of urgency. Oh. Like characters like him that barely need. A microphone. A, a classic one of those would be um, Ian Pearsley, sort of, you barely need a microphone for him. Yes, yes, no, no. Yes, yes, never, never, no, no. They tried to make me go to rehab. I said, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Could you have a into Alex Ferguson, perhaps? Alex Ferguson, yes. I can do Alex Ferguson, but only when drunk. For some, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. Sometimes you kind of leave certain characters uh, alone because somebody else does them and you've not really got too much more to say about them yourself. Um, I remember on Dead Ringers, Kevin Connolly would always do uh, Alex Ferguson and uh, I would normally I would normally do Sven Lauren Erickson I did a few times. He was a very intriguing uh, character. Well, he still is, but he's just not England manager anymore, so I'm not quite so aware of him. But yes, very cool and effusive. Um, the Professor Yaffle from Backpost of Sport. <laughs> Yes, yeah, always described as being rather cold and undemonstrative. But show me a bit of skirt, I'll be at it like a rat up a drain pipe. <laughs> uh, let's get some more questions. Oh, it's all, it's all starting now. It's all starting. Uh, let's have, let's go to you. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, we were having a, a pre-speech dinner, weren't we? And my habit is to to sort of colour sentences in with different tones of voice. And I find it rather relaxing, actually. I do find it rather relaxing to... Um, whatever thought sort of flutters past your mind. You know, if you're pouring out a cup of tea, for instance, I think Brian Sewell's always good in that situation. Yeah, yes, we don't, we, don't, we don't care for a cup of tea. Yes, I think having a cup of tea would be absolutely glorious and would, frankly, leave me slack-jawed with stupefaction. <laughs> Uh, oh, bless God, he's another one, you know, another nice one for uh, when you're having a cup of tea, something like that. Uh, so, yes, I do sort of pepper the conversation. Wasn't too infuriating, was it? No. That's all right. Uh, yes, hello there at the back there. Sort of at the back, almost. We're well, sort of midway, really. Anyway, you're there. Hello. Um, I was wondering, um, before you sort of publicise your impressions, is there someone you've practised them to quite, and also could you do Andy Murray? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. There is somewhere that I think you... Uh, you sort of publicise the first sort of once you've got uh, you know when you need to learn a new character 
you'll build up a few references, perhaps on the Sky Plus, that you can watch and watch again, watch and watch again, listen and repeat, and just try to etch it onto your subconscious somehow, uh, and try and just get it stuck on there. And then you might just practice, you might just listen to what the, uh, just listen and repeat as I was saying, and then your first tentative step uh, to publicly do the voice, probably in the local pub, you know, when the audience is, uh, I say the audience, you know, your mates sat around the table, um, when they'll give you an honest kind of view uh, about it, and uh, so the, the pub is the place to start it off, really. And what was the other half of the question? Uh, Andy Murray. Andy Murray, okay. I was just being still for a while, so that, you know, my vocal cords would settle down. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, Andy Murray would be sort of like, you know, number one on the scale of a vocal delivery like that. And then you could sort of like, take it back up to Billy Conley again like this. <laughs> that would be number 11 on the way. Oh, well, yeah, Andy Murray sort of like, um, yes, that would be, so we, we did a, a sketch I very much enjoyed on our last series where you had the, uh, the Andy Murray learn tennis sort of Wii Fit game. You know, <laughs> learn what it's like to really actually be me. <laughs> Try to progress all the way to the dizzy heights of the semi-final. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, we should go to this side. I think yes, gentlemen, just there. Good evening. Uh, two actually. You've got a great voice. I like it. <laughs> That's good. Yours would be quite. You wouldn't take me long to nail your tone of voice. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are rather similar. I think Ray Winston. <laughs> Ray Winston, much more the gangster. Much more the gangster like that. You're lucky sitting back there asking me a question, mugging me off like that. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, sort of like, yeah, you know, Harry Redknapp, you know, I think, um... <laughs> You know, I think anybody who refers to somebody, you know, with a lot of money in the future, you know, they'll be saying that the phrase they'll use is, you know, how rich is Redknapp's dog? You know, <laughs> someone like that. He was one of those, um, there's many more arrogant uh, football managers uh, the, these days. You know, I remember, you know, the time, you know, in the 80s and part of the 90s when all the football managers, you know, had this sort of tone, you know, we tried to create some chances, they tried to create some chances. At the end of the day, if you're not going to win the game, just try and grind out a result, really, and that's... You, know, you sort of go into it, predictability. Uh, but Mourinho is uh, much more different. I hope that he, uh, my job, it is to win. <laughs> my team, they did play well. To lose, this is, to die. The legend is looking at one, and now the end is near. Boom, boom. <laughs> to win, to win is to have Jessica Alba <laughs> in a swimsuit for champagne of your naked body. To lose, is to have John Prescott in Speedos for brown hair. So I'm glad that there's managers like him that contrast against uh, Harry Redknapp. Much as we love him, you know, much as all of that. Uh, let's go across to uh, the... Yes, the, the fellow in the white shirt there, yes, sir. Uh, can you do Arnold Schwarzenegger in Steve <laughs> <laughs> They are rather contrasting, are they not? <laughs> Stephen Hawking. Um, and now, available for the first time on one album, Stephen Hawking's 20 Golden Love Songs. <laughs> Who could forget classics like, I just called to say, I love you. <laughs> I just called to say how much I care. I just called to say I love you. And I mean it from the at the roundabout to take the third exit. Thank you very much for you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay, let's go for the fellow. I, I find David Dimble a bit terribly useful for um, pointing people out. Yes, uh, so the gentleman in the, uh, in the maroon uh, top with the string around the neck club. Yes. Yeah, that, that's um, right. Yes. Jeremy Kyle. Jeremy Kyle. Oh, you don't watch him, do you? 
I suppose it's just, it's an interesting bit of perspective of a morning, isn't it? To sort of uh, Jeremy Carr, you watch Jeremy Carr because you're scum. <laughs> Watch Jeremy Carr, what are you doing? You're trying to waste your life. Turn off Jeremy Carr and get out of your lectures, you scum! <laughs> well, I'm glad I don't have to be here for too long. Right, we'll come to you next, but you've had your hand up loads, so you've had your hand up loads. So let's ask you, let's have yours uh, now. You can, you can, bear, I, I like your accent, that's good. <laughs> you can, you, yes, definitely, you can have two, we can do that, yes. Uh, Jeremy Clarkson, yes. He's one of those characters with that wonderful kind of arrogance about him. Jeremy Clarkson, woof! <laughs> one of those characters where the thing that accompanies the voice is the walk and the hand gesture. People say that cars cause pollution. Nonsense. People say that cars are bad for the environment. Not so. Their bright colours encourage butterflies to mate. <laughs> the spillover from their windscreen washers parch... Hang on, what is it now? Yes, the spillover from... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'll read that again. Yes, I'm trying to remember what the original joke was. Oh yes, the spillover from their windscreen washers uh, irrigates our parched lawns. <laughs> Here's Jeremy Clarkson, the single reason as to why, in ten years, Greenland won't exist. <laughs> uh, who was the other one? Dumbledore. Dumbledore. <laughs> Do you know, I've never watched Harry Potter. I, like, I always thought I'd sort of outgrown it a little bit, but... Um... <laughs> Maybe, I, I, I don't know, it's sort of, uh, this is one of those things where if you don't know immediately, it sort of takes you on to uh, the nearest approximate item, uh, which I'm sort of having as Tom Baker. <laughs> yes, I suppose he's got a certain Dumbledorean quality, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I rather like that, I rather like that, yes. Yes, it sort of sends you off into a bit of a trance, Tom Baker, like that. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne sort of sends you into a similar trance as well, I... You know, in, in, uh, doing uh, uh, the Osborne and I, you know, it's quite sort of, you know, relaxing. Uh, what, what are all you people doing inside my living room? <laughs> a nice couple of questions. Any, any more while we're at it? Any more? That was your, that was your two done, was it? Okay. Let's, uh, let's have, uh, is the lady there in the, uh, yes, you, hello there. Did you Rob Brighton? Rob Brighton, that's, I, I'm sort of, this is just off the top of my head now. Sort of off the top of my head. Now I've, I've done, yeah, I've done, um, I've done adverts for yogurt with uh, Rob Ryan, but never sort of uh, taken notice of his, of his voice. So uh, next time I'll have that all nice and he does a wonderful uh, Ken Bruce. I remember we, we've done. He did his Ken Bruce, and alongside him I sort of did my Terry Wogan. <laughs> like that you see. Now Billy Connolly sort of walks and talks at the same time, slightly different with Terry Wogan. Every word. Was sort of, <laughs> Hey, kind of a gradual moving forward like that. <laughs> Sometimes quite slowly, but then a nice little spurt, I can't <laughs> say. So yes, uh, okay, uh, the, 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 yes, with the stripy garment, good evening, yes. Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed? <laughs> Don't think so, underdog. <laughs> Free advice. <laughs> there, that's in dealt with, thank you very much indeed, yes, okay. Uh, gentleman there, good evening. Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman, once again, through... <laughs> I'm going to say I don't know Alan Rickman by uh, not watching Harry Potter. Uh, other Alan Rickman films are, of course, available. Yeah, that was one... <laughs> that was the one through uh, Spitting Image that uh, Phil Cornwall did. Uh, so I never bothered to learn it. But I did do Obi-Wan Kenobi alongside him. Yes, what a party that was. <laughs> it's gone nice and echoey once again. Uh, any, anyone we haven't had. Yeah, let's let's go to you. When it comes to the impression show, yes. do you write your own script or does someone else do it? Well, there's a, there's a team of us. Um, I do I, I do write a fair bit of it. Uh, come up with ideas of who we want to do, what sort of situations we'd like to put them in, and what we'd sort of like to do with them. And then a team of writers will sort of write that up and put the basic form of it together. And then we'll read it through and perform it and see how it reads and see how it comes to life. And then a few amendments here and there. 
and then it becomes a case of uh, you can actually film due to logistics and timing and all of those sorts of things. So, uh, so yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, can we do a Jonathan Moss? Okay, funny, 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 funny. But Jonathan Moss, the best sense of a pimp, but none of the manners. Funny, 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 funny. That'll be six million pounds, please. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, hand up over there with the scarf. Do you know what? Yeah, Nick Robinson, I think, is probably my fav one of my favourite new characters. But, yes, David Attenborough, or Lord Attenborough, and it is here that we see the creatures collectively known as the Cambridge Union in the natural habitat. <laughs> and who was the other one? Uh, Nick Robinson. Nick Robinson. So, Kath and Nick Robinson impression has to be done straight after David Attenborough. The Prime Minister would say it's a big ask. Maybe the contrast will be too great. Maybe it couldn't be achievable in the given time. But one thing's for sure, this is going to be a Prime Minister who's going to do all in his power to try and make that happen. But will it all cut here? And if you understand any of that, then you're better than me, Fiona. <laughs> I never go to you. I'm sorry, I, I, I said we'd go to you and then I didn't. I have betrayed you. <laughs> <laughs> forgive me, forgive me. Yes, well, well your death. God bless you, sir. Uh, yes, yes, I do. Um, I am um, oddly uh, Denise Robertson, the uh, agony aunt on this morning. For, for some reason, I can do an impression of her. I like the sort of odd impressions like that, 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 that there's no rhyme or reason for you to do them, but they're just there somewhere. So, Denise Robertson, I mean, she normally comes on about quarter past eleven with her nice bit of advice like that. I think that you should write to her or phone her up, or if she won't accept that, just try to communicate somehow how you feel. And if that doesn't work, I think you should settle it in the pub car park, pet. But I wish you well. For some reason, uh, the other one, um, I, uh, I, I had to learn an Anne Widdicombe impression uh, for our last series because um, uh, some wonderful writers came up with a, a scenario uh, where Anne Widdicombe took the Sharon Stone role in Basic Instinct, you see. Yes, I know, I know. And yes, she has a very uh, intriguing voice, uh, sometimes very, very high, like this. I'm just speaking at the front of the throat there, and then other times it sort of goes a little bit lower, like this. <laughs> and uh, she's sort of uh, a, 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 a yodeling speaker in this sort of way, and there's just no fumbling it, but a wee little bit. <laughs> so, yes, God, I'm, so yes, I, I think so. Uh, or who else? Yeah, Hilary DeVay from Dragon's Den. <laughs> I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> what I'm going to do, I'm going to offer you half the money. <laughs> and I think if I go on any further, she'll be at the level that only dogs and cats can hear. <laughs> uh, right, yes, uh, the fellow there in the knitwear. Good evening. Oh, yes, Simon, Simon Sharma, the most <laughs> highly paid Thunderbird puppet that there has ever been. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those where his sink and his walk is synced up to his, um, to his, it's a while since I've done him, I've forgotten what the jokes were. But that wonderful sort of wobbly quality, promoting free speech and the art of debating since 1815. <laughs> I just read the thing on a Simon Sharma sort of style and it sounded rather right. Pause, look into camera, walk away. <laughs> David Starkey, one of, one of Kevin Connolly's. I remember him being something like this. This doesn't quite sound like David Starkey. I'm not sure. I think it's going somewhere near Ian Hislop again. <laughs> Rather oddly. Bar. <laughs> but uh, thank you. I, 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 I hope that, uh, that settles that okay for you. How are we doing for time, by the way? Am I overrunning? Yeah. Five minutes. Yes, sir. We're, we're, we're just a bit. Five or ten minutes, I think that's absolutely ample. And, Success was, uh, thank you very much indeed. Well, that's a good estimation. That's, it's nice, nice to know what you've got to work with. That's part uh, Right at the back, let's go for you there. 
Yes, that's one of those, uh, that's uh, an Alistair McGowan one, but I always like the way that he would say, Wibble! <laughs> that's sort of like just a, a little key thing there. But uh, yeah, that's, that's one that uh, sometimes, you know, certain characters live with other people, and uh, I think that's, that, that, that's one of his, and he, he does that beautifully. Think of another one, and let's see if we can, let's see if we can get one in for you. Uh, okay, let's, let's go for you there. Now then, um... Hello. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Griff Reese Jones, he's, he's a character. He's, he's sort of one of those who's got that wonderfully, <laughs> wonderfully sort of erratic delivery like that. Uh, sort of a sentence, very attacking and very sort of loud like that. And then he sort of goes on. I love the way he sort of talks and laughs at the same time like that. <laughs> He's got uh, a, a sort of a grinding tone at the, the back of his throat there. Um, I, I like characters that have a sort of, um, sort of that sort of fluffy kind of quality, a warmth there. I, I remember, just so going back, we were talking earlier about uh, when you meet people that you do, and sometimes it's a strange thing because you never quite know what their reaction is going to be. You never quite know. You, there's always a bit of a tentative look where you think, Ooh, uh, was it all right? Did they mind? Did we overstep the mark? Um, I remember presenting this award ceremony called the Business in the Community Awards at the Albert Hall, and the guest of honour uh, was the Prince of Wales. And halfway through the event, uh, one of his team, one of his staff, came along and said, oh, now, when you um, present the key prize, uh, his Royal Highness will be presenting that one, so uh, that will be your time to introduce him then. And he's got a wonderful sense of humour, so do announce him uh, using his own voice. He's got a wonderful sense of humour. He'll love it. He'll adore it. I thought this would be quite jolly. This will uh, be a nice surprising thing that the audience will appreciate. Because it was quite a formal, rather stuffy kind of do. So this would have been a welcome little sprinkle of, uh, of light and um, slight rebelliousness, perhaps. And so uh, I thought, this is very good. I'm looking forward to this. And then it plays on your mind a little bit. And you think, hang on, what was this really? a member of uh, Prince Charles's entourage. <laughs> Maybe this was somebody from some sleazy, unpalatable, red-top tabloid just trying to catch me out here. Maybe I shouldn't do this at all. And then you, you stop, you know, you think, don't be so paranoid. Of course it was a member of Prince Charles's team, and of course he would love that, and it would be a, a welcome little moment of lightness and informality. So, uh, the moment came, and it was time to present the key trophy, the key prize of the evening. And um, I remember stepping forward to, uh, to, to introduce the Prince of Wales, who had the trophy ready to present, the main trophy. It wasn't really a trophy, it was more like um, a Marks and Spencer's sapling, kind of a, a symbolic prize it was. And I remember stepping forward to the microphone and saying, well, now it really does give me enormous pleasure to, uh, to introduce the presenter of our main prize in the ceremony tonight. Uh, would you please welcome His Royal Highness, uh, the Prince of Wales, cufflink fiddle, cufflink fiddle. <laughs> and I'm looking over and he's staying sitting down and he's not moving and he's got a look on his face as if to say, <laughs> and he starts to look, um, irritated, affronted, and then this real look of anger, his, his forehead creased up, and uh, there was a sort of, oh dear, this is a, a, a wave of surprise and mild shock sort of ripple out, and then it all went very, very surreal, time seemed to just slow down, and I was thinking, oh no, that was not a member of Prince Charles's team, it was someone from some sleazy red top tabloid, and how could I be so gullible as to fall for that, and how could I be so stupid as to believe it? And uh, he's still sitting down there, and he's looking even angrier and angrier, and it's becoming more and more surreal, and all of a sudden he goes, ah. <laughs> He didn't do the two fingers bit, I just made that up. <laughs> and then he steps forward to his, uh, to his lectern from a, a chair rather similar to this one, as a matter of fact. You know, I do find that uh, having a voice like this is terribly good for royal duties. Uh, but the rest of the time, you don't know I don't talk like this. I think I'm... Uh, <laughs> So that was a time when uh, I avoided uh, being beheaded. So, uh, it's good to see you again, sir. Now, uh, not long ago, oh, <laughs> not long ago, uh, last year I did uh, a speech at uh, the Oxford Union, and, and you were there, weren't you? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Come and join us again. Come and join us again, because um, 
Is this fellow known to you? I yes. can see a number of people in this room who are not unacquainted with like yourself. Brilliant, yes, this is actually for real. This is how this is how you actually sound, isn't it? It's not. Well, yes, you see, in fact, you see, if I'm singing Mozart Magic Flute as the Queen's Knight, it's through off the spire, but uh, I'm present this fellow there. Exactly, exactly. And we had a <laughs> we had a challenge to uh, make you uh, see if you could do an impersonation. Yes, and I said, a voice. yes, it's speaking a common <laughs> voice. And we <laughs> said, <laughs> it was quite unsuspicious. Well, I don't know. I think remember it was not. Yes, yes, it was Neil Gallagher. I think we were trying. Yes, I Neil. think it was Neil Gallagher. Perhaps it was Elise. I thought so. Thank you, Captain Taylor. Well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> in many ways, that's very true in his case too. Uh, but I did rather like the Liam Gallagher that you did uh, come up with, and I think. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, top one R kids, sort your life out, sort your napper out, let's get it on, last chance to dance. Could you give us one more time well, yes, your Liam Gallagher? It's all about modulation of the vowels, you see, because it might be very high, and the castle, I suppose the castle, I don't have to take it, but it's kind of a safe love, I don't know what's going So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so what would you like to say from Liam Gallagher's perspective? From Liam Gallagher's perspective, well, I, I think... This I think you should say... <laughs> Come on, our kid, let's get it sorted. Last chance to dance, let's have it. Come on, our kid, last chance to sort it, let's get it started. Just very much, what a nice surprise to see you get. You have the most extraordinary voice in the world, I'm quite sure of it. No, 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 very, very true. I remember I, I was cashing in a little bit of my, uh, my knowledge of... Uh, Astrophysics, which you can probably fit on, well, perhaps not just one stamp, maybe a book of, of six stamps. And um, I remember saying, I, I remember recalling uh, a little bit of my knowledge of, uh, yes, I've, I've gone into Boris. If Boris is your vocal neighbour. <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, the problem with uh, black holes is sort of um, infinite mass, zero volume. No, that's one of the problems with black holes. And everybody gave a round of applause for being so uh, marvellous and astute. I th another round of applause. What is your name again, Brian? Yeah, yes, it is indeed Tim. I give a round of applause for Tim. For you, uh, <laughs> thank you. You are most welcome, Tom. Top one, nice one, sorting. A wonderful Liam Gallagher. Superb. Um, finally, okay, well, let's, let's have a, one more. Okay, a variety. Okay, well, let's, let's try that. Let's try that. It's been... Oh, different Doctor Who's instead of Tom Baker. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> different Doctor Who's. Okay. Um, let's go through the Doctor Who's. William Hartnell. Uh, conquer the Earth, you poor pathetic creatures. Don't you realise? To conquer the Earth, you will have to destroy all living matter. <laughs> That's quite good. Um, Patrick Troughton. Um, Oh dear. He could be playing the game of wrestle on at this very moment. Oh my giddy out! Um, John, you, you are familiar with these other Doctor Who's, I take it. Yes, I suppose so. Uh, John Pert, who my Doctor Who, he was, he was the first one. Uh, I've reversed the polarity of the neutron flow so the TARDIS should be free of the force field now. <laughs> yes, well, I might have known you'd be behind all this. My, 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 but just re going over the lines. And then, of course, we have Tom Baker. Then Peter Davison, much more breathy. I am Lord President, am I not? You obey my commands. Um, and then, yes, Colin Baker, like that. Mm, yes, change, my dear. Um, Celeste McCoy, who I had a curry with the other night. Mm, sort of mix them all up and make, make this cake. You know. uh, who else do we have? Christopher Eccleston, one of the favourites. Rose, Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to recall some other sort of Christopher Eccleston phrases. I'm not saying that. Um, <laughs> Matt Smith, I've not sort of watched really too much, but he sort of does that, doesn't he? He dances like that, and eats fish finger and custard sandwiches. Uh, but there, a nice, nice little selection there. Uh, thank you once again for asking. It's at the light in green there. Graham Norton, yes. I'm so glad that you asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> and I so hope that that red chair goes backwards when I push the button. It does not, it stayed where it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will, I think, yes, I'm, uh, we, we probably better, I'll do what? I'll do one more, sir. <laughs> they won't like, they won't like Chuck as they are, do they, you know? 
Just finally, um, sometimes people do ask, do characters change as they go along? David Cameron, who we alluded to earlier, much more confident these days, I think. Uh, I was channel hopping the other day, just trying to see what sort of form he was showing. And channel hopping, channel hopping, channel hopping. He was trying to find the daily politics or the Parliament channel, one of those. And just channel hop, channel hop, channel hop. And then all of a sudden, there he was, David Cameron, in very confident mood, striding up to the dispatch box to really take the debate to Ed Miliband and just sort of give off the right image. And he powered up to that dispatch box with a great confident swagger. And he says, I'm my lover, he looks toilet seat for me mother. Adjustable spanner set for me brother. The parasite's ten wood and bed pajamas. I have a lawn more cause I bought me fathers. I love an anatin cause my head is splitting. Ten balls of wool so I can do me knitting. I love a chaffa cake and a package of my dodgers. And the autobiography of Ginger Rogers. Um, but I might have got the wrong channel on thinking about it. But you've been a glorious audience. It's been lovely to come and have a word with you. I thought that was a fantastic, I, didn't, I wouldn't quite call it a speech, it's more of a performance, but um, it was brilliant, I think we all really enjoyed it, so well, if, you join me, the same, <laughs> if, you, if you join me again um, in thanking John Coleshaw for spending time with us. Lovely to be here, and you're my favourites. <laughs>